December 1942 Above the Solomons, a teenage waste gunner named Eddie Kowalski braces inside a B-17, fingers clamped on a Browning .50 that chatters like machinery gone wild. A zero flashes across his view at 10 o'clock, a few hundred yards away, slicing left to right. Eddie does what every nerve tells him is right. He centers the fighter in his sight and squeezes. Tracers stitch the sky, bright beads curving harmlessly behind the Japanese aircraft. The zero never even twitches. Eddie's ammo counter spins toward zero and the fighter glides on untouched. Scenes like that were routine in the early war. Crews were trained, determined, and armed with excellent guns, yet hit rates against crossing fighters were miserable. Film pulled from gun cameras in 1943 told the story without argument. When a target moved sideways across the sight picture, only a tiny fraction of bullets connected. A typical burst might flood the air with more than a hundred rounds in the few seconds a fighter was in range, and only a handful found metal. That was not enough to break a tough airframe or stop a determined pilot. Losses reflected the math. Bomber groups took brutal casualties month after month. Crews returned with empty turrets and full frustration, convinced they were doing what they had been taught, yet watching enemy planes carve through the formation. The problem was not effort or courage. It was time in motion. A bullet leaves the muzzle fast, but not infinitely fast. At a few hundred yards, the flight time is a third of a second or more, and in that sliver of time a fighter at combat speed covers well over a hundred feet. Aim at what you see and your rounds arrive where the target used to be. Deflection error had a name, and theorists knew it existed long before the shooting started. The required correction, however, ran counter to instinct. At a right-angle crossing shot, the proper lead at common ranges could be measured in car lengths, not inches. Put the sight on empty sky well in front of the nose and trust the stream will meet the airplane. That felt wrong to the human brain, especially under fire. Schools tried to teach it with diagrams and toad sleeves, but the numbers kept changing with angle, distance, relative speed, climb, or dive, even the bomber's own motion. A gunner had seconds to sort all of that while breathing oxygen through a mask and bouncing through flak. Under stress, most people revert to what feels obvious. They walked their fire back toward the thing that scared them, and the tracers went wide again. Buried in an old file cabinet was a warning that should have changed everything. In the 1920s, an American artillery officer, James Puckle, wrote a dry technical paper proving that as aircraft speeds climbed, the lead angles would soon outstrip human intuition. He published tables that made instructors blanch. At certain speeds and ranges, you had to aim several aircraft lengths ahead. The conclusion was stark. Without help, gunners would miss. The paper was archived and forgotten as aviation leapt ahead and training methods stayed anchored in a slower era. The British felt the pain first in 1940. RAF squadrons with brilliant pilots and excellent airplanes still struggled to hit agile opponents in crossing passes. One squadron leader, an avid clay shooter before the war, grounded his unit during the desperate days of the Battle of Britain and tried something heretical. Instead of telling pilots to calculate lead, he trained them to feel it. Fly through the target's path and begin firing while still turning. Let your motion create the lead and stop trying to pause and aim. At first, shots went nowhere. After dozens of passes, hit percentages crept up, then doubled. The improvement was modest on paper, but on combat footing it meant more damaged enemy fighters and fewer coming back for another try. The lesson spread unevenly through fighter command, embraced by some and ignored by others. But the principle was clear. Conscious arithmetic was too slow. Trained motion could be faster. Bomber gunners did not have the luxury of maneuvering their own aircraft to build lead. They stood in windows and turrets on machines that had to hold formation. If the head could not do the math and the body could not bank to help, the fix had to come from a device. At MIT's radiation laboratory, under Charles Stark Draper, engineers built exactly that. Their solution, a gyroscopically stabilized computing site, asked the gunner for two things estimate range by matching the reticle to the target's known wingspan, and keep the target centered while tracking. Inside, cams and gears word. Using target angular rate, bullet ballistics, and the range input, the site solved the lead problem dozens of times a second and painted a luminous aim point not on the airplane, but in front of it. Put the dot where it belonged and fire. Hit rates jumped immediately in trials, 
and climbed higher with a little practice. The device turned pencil and paper deflection tables into a moving light the hands could follow. Mass installation takes time, and time was the one commodity in shortest supply. Many crews flew on with simple sights and iron will. An interim answer came from the deck plates, not the lab. In the Pacific, a waste gunner named William Fleming kept notes after each engagement. He sketched enemy aircraft and marked where his successful bursts had been aimed relative to the target's length. Two plane lengths for this angle, three for that. A decorated carrier ace spotted the value immediately and turned Fleming's notebook into a teaching method. On the flight deck, sailors walked a model airplane on a pole across the gunner's view at different angles. The rule was simple, lead by the target's own length. Count one, two, three fuselages forward depending on the crossing angle, then fire. Within weeks, documented hit rates in that air group more than doubled on crossing shots. Other carriers copied the drill and added refinements, but the magic was the same. Humans are poor at guessing feet and yards at range, but excellent at comparing relative sizes. The target itself became the ruler the BY mid 1944. The Army Air Forces adopted a similar approach in Europe. Manuals began showing leads as multiples of wingspans and fuselage lengths. Gunnery schools stretched their courses, increased round counts, and spent far more time on fast moving targets at realistic speeds. New drills put guns on powered mounts and dragged targets at high speed across wide ranges, forcing students to repeat lead shots until the correction sank below conscious thought. Instructors talked less and let feedback do the teaching. See where the strike is, adjust, shoot again. After enough repetitions, the hands moved to the right point without a debate in the head. Psychologists embedded with air units noticed a second obstacle that training had to overcome. Under extreme threat, people fixate. As a fighter rushed head-on, closing speed huge and impact seconds away, gunners who started with proper lead would often slide their aim back onto the oncoming shape. The name given to that failure was threat fixation collapse. The antidote was the same as in every high-stress skill. So much repetition that technique survives panic. The best gunners, those who lived through dozens of missions, kept their lead steady even when tracer lines and cannon flashes were drilling straight at them. They were terrified and correct at the same time. Their bodies drew the figure eight that hit, while the mind screamed. That level of performance takes weeks and mound. Of ammunition most wartime pipelines could not spare, which meant effectiveness varied. A formation with several veterans could look lethal. A formation of new crews could look porous. Enemy pilots learned to watch for the difference and pick on the weak spots. The deflection revolution did not end in 1945. Draper's gyrocytes improved and migrated to jets. Analog wheels gave way to digital processors. Radar-assisted gun sites predicted where to shoot in fractions of a second. Missiles pushed the problem to longer ranges, but the math stayed exactly the same. Modern seekers and fire control computers do what Eddie could not, and what Fleming taught with a stick and a model airplane. They aim at the future position, recalculate continuously, and correct their course as conditions change. Even so, aviators still practice guns only engagements because learning to see where a moving object will be trains the mind in geometry and timing that applies to everything else. Navy schools still talk about lead pursuit and angle off because those ideas matter whether you squeeze a trigger or pickle a missile. Ground and naval defenses use automated versions of the same logic. A shipboard close in weapon tracks an incoming threat and throws a stream of rounds at where the threat will be a fraction of a second from now, iterating faster than a human can blink. The machine never panics and never drags the sight back to the visible target out of fear. You can even watch the lesson play out in simulators and games. New players fire directly at what they see and miss behind. After enough frustration, they start putting rounds into empty space, and suddenly hits appear. With time, the hands get there on their own. The axis of improvement from the early war's 4% hit rates to the late war's far higher numbers came less from hardware than from accepting how people actually perceive motion and stress, than designing training and tools around that reality. The real achievement is not that a particular site or drill worked. It is that air forces learned to distrust instinct when physics says otherwise, and to replace it with either a machine or a habit that produces the correct outcome. 
Thousands of men who might have died made it home because they learned to fire at sky that looked empty and believed their bullets would meet an airplane there. That lesson has a life beyond turrets and cockpits. In any field where speed and uncertainty punish hesitation, success often demands that we override what feels natural and act on what the numbers require.